Right. Good evening, colleagues. Uh, we now resume our stage two consideration of the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill. Um, and we're into the last lap, so I'd like to wish Emma Harper happy birthday. It's been a heck of a way to spend your birthday. Um, but thank you for staying with us, and we hope there's some cake left by the time we get back out there. Anyway, uh, let's go on to business. Uh, I call Amendment 175 in the name of Adam Tompkins, grouped with other amendments as shown in the groupings. Members will note from the groupings there's a number of preemptions in this group, and I will remind members of a preemption when I call the relevant amendment. Adam Tompkins to move Amendment 175 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, th thank you, Convener. I move Amendment 175 uh, in, in my name. Uh, the effect of Amendment 175 um, is, is simply to uh, improve the quantity and quality of uh, parliamentary oversight um, of regulations to be made under some of the key provisions uh, of this legislation, namely sections 11, 12 uh, and 13, which have already been uh, debated. Um, uh, as, the, as currently drafted, section 14, subsection 1 requires that some, but not all, um, regulations made under sections 11, 1, 12 and 13, 1 will be subject to the affirmative procedure. And my amendment simply uh, 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 um, deletes the condition so that all regulations to be made under section 11, 1, 12 and 13, 1 would be subject to the affirmative procedure. It's a simple amendment. There's nothing more to say about it. I move. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 176 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I do have um, seven amendments in this group, uh, so I will, in the interest of time, speak only to my own uh, amendments, if members allow me. Uh, amendments 176 and uh, 180 uh, are very similar in wording to Amendment 126, which was passed earlier. So. Uh, I think there's uh, very little point in uh, reliving the arguments in favour of the wording as they mirror an amendment which has already passed. So for that reason, 176 and 180 are largely technical amendments at this stage <coughs> in proceedings, and I hope the members will uh, support them. Uh, they, in effect, relate to our new direction of travel and how public bodies may be amended to carrying out its functions, as was agreed earlier. Uh, 181. Uh, now, this amendment uh, is in relation to section 14, uh, and all it does, seeks to do, is increase the period of scrutiny time available to Parliament from 60 to 90 days before an instrument, as detailed in subsection 5, comes into force. Uh, the rationale, I think, is, will be fairly obvious. Uh, three months instead of two months uh, before an instrument comes into force allows, in my view, optimal, uh, an optimal uh, period of time required to scrutinise it through the parliamentary process. I hope the Minister will agree to this extension, as I think it fits uh, better with the current norms in scrutiny timelines. Uh, moving on to uh, Amendment 182. This is a slightly different uh, subject, but still in relation to Section 14. This amendment ensures that any regulations introduced by Ministers as a result of Section 14 are also accompanied by a review of their financial implications. Uh, I think that is important because as the Scottish Parliament works its way through devolved retained EU law, uh, there needs to be provisions in this bill whereby Scottish Ministers update Parliament on the finan financial implications. Uh, looking at fin the financial memorandum, sec section 18 of it states, uh, and this is an important point, that some possible uses of the powers would have more significant cost implications. The powers uh, in this bill could be used, for example, to transfer significant regulatory functions to existing public bodies in Scotland or to create new bodies for the purpose of exercising functions currently discharged at EU level. Close quote. Uh, the financial memorandum also states that the costs are very difficult to quantify at this point, and I accept that. But it is right that when these costs are known to Parliament, Parliament should be informed. My amendment places an obligation on ministers to keep Parliament informed of the cost implications arising from. Uh, regulations in section 14. Uh, and I'll group together finally amendments 189 to 192. This uh, relates to section uh, 15 of the bill. At the moment, the wording in the bill says, and I quote, such persons as they consider appropriate. Uh, and that's in terms of uh, the consultation on draft proposals uh, that Scottish uh, ministers must adhere to. Just to repeat that, such persons as they consider appropriate. 
So my three amendments in this do the following. 189 introduces committees to the scrutiny process via whichever procedure is suitable and available to them. I think this is an important addition because committees are best placed to scrutinise proposals for regulations introduced uh, under Section uh, 14. 190 asks that committees are also given adequate time to consult and, where appropriate, take evidence on people that it deems fit to give a plurality of opinion on the subject matter of the Minister's proposal to make regulations. This seems to me naturally a better way of consulting on new regulations than simply having to uh, or leaving to such persons as Scottish Ministers consider appropriate, which is the current drafting. 192 simply defines what a relevant committee is, as this is a new term which I have introduced to the Bill, and clearly that should be whichever committee has been defined as the lead committee based on the subject matter of the regulation. I hope members will take on board uh, with these, uh, which I think are quite positive amendments. Thank you. Thank you. James Kelly to speak to Amendment 39 and other amendments in the group. Okay, convener. Uh, amendment, uh, I move Amendment 39 in my, my name. This amendment uh, seeks to introduce the affirmative power in relation to sections 11, 12 and 13 and therefore introduces greater scrutiny and transparency to the bill and enhances it, in my view, as a result. I want to indicate support for all other amendments in the group, with the exception of 181 in Jamie Green's name, uh, the, on the basis that it extends the, the time for laying of the procedure from 60 days to 90 days. Uh, I prefer the uh, original timetable. In terms of 191 and Dean in relation to Dean, Dean Lockhart, I don't support that amendment either. Uh, although it's a reasonable amendment and makes some good points about additional documentation, it, uh, it takes out the section in the government amendment, which gives regard for uh, due regard for representations that have been made. And uh, I think that's a, a reasonable proposal from the government, and as such, would prefer to see that kept in. Thank you. The Minister to speak to Amendment 177 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Uh, let me start with other amendments and I'll come to mine in a second. Uh, there are three amendments, 175 and James Kelly's Amendment 39, read with Amendment 37 in an earlier group, which would make all regulations under the main powers in the Bill subject to the affirmative procedure, no matter what their content. I have to say we do not regard that as an appropriate or even possible way forward. And I want to be very clear about that, because I am in this section going to accept a, a number of amendments. But where, amend, where amendments would actually make the bill inoperable, I have to make that clear. Uh, and this is going to be a significant challenge in any case to take forward the legislative burden. These amendments actually make it much, much harder. And amendments 178 and 179 from Jackson Carlow go even further. And they make everything subject not to the affirmative procedure, but to, to the enhanced affirmative procedure. These amendments would make the bill impossible to operate. Rather than a prudent workable fallback that can be deployed in the event of no agreement, and of course we're still working for an agreement, the Scottish Parliament would instead be left with an unworkable and impractical bill that couldn't be deployed effectively because no government and no parliament could do so within the reasonable time. This is part of the balance to which members have referred. And this pushes the balance way beyond what is operable or workable. So I do strongly urge the committee to reject these amendments and to focus instead on what the government has proposed and the reassurance that we're going to work very closely with the parliamentary authorities, as we do currently, to manage the legislative programme going forward. And also the bona fides we have shown in earlier sections in accepting amendments. I'm about to accept some more here now. And the fact that we have taken on board all the recommendations of the Delegated Powers Committee. So we, we have shown a strong willingness to move on these issues. But when something becomes inoperable, it is really important that we say so and say so clearly. And I don't think I've actually said so in terms of any other amendments as strongly. But these simply don't make the bill possible to work in the way it needs to work. Now, amendments 176, 180 and 182 by Jamie Green relate to something different. They're connected to the proposal that the Scottish Minister should have the ability to redefine the general objects of a public authority in consequence of EU withdrawal. 
Now, we didn't ask for this power, and indeed we said the last time that there was an amendment on this, which was earlier today. I seem to remember the things are uh, merging together in a sort of legislative blur. Uh, we did actually indicate we didn't want this power, but the committee saw fit to pass the power. So I see no point in resisting these am amendments, and I would suggest that they're simply accepted. And that is also another indication that we are willing to look at this bill and change the bill as it goes forward. Amendment 177 is an amendment in my name intended to clarify the instruments subject to the affirmative procedure. We think that regulations should be subject to the affirmative procedure when they confer on a domestic public authority a function currently held by a European institution. Section 14.2D of the Bill as introduced set out a narrower test. This short amendment corrects the point, and I'd like the committee to vote for it if they could. Amendment 181 in the name of Jamie Green would make the period of scrutiny given to Parliament under the enhanced affirmative procedure last for 90 rather than 60 days. Now, given that this is a bill about the substantial time pressures the Scottish Government and indeed the Scottish Parliament will have to undertake in trying to deliver a programme of change required for Brexit through no timetable of our own, we think this would be unwise. The enhanced procedure has already been enhanced by proposals for the Scottish Government and for a period of statutory consultation and for additional reports to be laid before Parliament on that consulta consultation. Uh, the Scottish Government has moved a substantial direction uh, in, in order to, to make the uh, enhanced affirmative procedure much more responsive. Uh, and I think that this would simply uh, go in a direction that would make it ever harder to operate the bill. And I'm sure that that is not uh, the intention. I am sure that no member would come here and endeavour to wreck a bill. So I, I do think that we should consider very carefully whether amendments, even amendments that are well meant, actually will have consequences that have not been considered. Jamie Green's amendments 189, 190, and 192 also add to the complexity of scrutiny. They would require scrutiny of proposals to legislate under the enhanced procedure by all relevant parliamentary committees. As drafted, the bill requires proposals to be laid before Parliament at the start of the process and an explanation of the con consultation to be laid before Parliament at the end, where appropriate parliamentary committees could respond to such proposals with their own investigation. But I don't want to see such a requirement set out in the face of the statute. As been aptly demonstrated by the last week's activity, the Parliament and its officials are more than capable of responding flexibly where necessary to developing demands for evidence, investigation and scrutiny. Donald Cameron's Amendment 183 misunderstands, I think, the role of the presiding officer. At present, failures to comply fully with procedural requirements relating to secondary legislation must be explained in letters to the presiding officer. This bill continues this well-established practice in relation to the enhanced affirmative procedure. Mr Cameron's amendment would change this so that the ministers had to write to the Scottish Parliament instead. The presiding officer's role in this regard is to uphold the standards expected of ministers by the law and the standing orders. It's a scrutiny role. For consistency's sake, he should continue to have this role rather than to be weakened, which he would be by this, um, and the Parliament would be weakened by this uh, amendment. All letters to the presiding officer from ministers in relation to subordinate legislation are published and the failures are scrutinised as of a, a, an obligation by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. I'd like to thank Donald Cameron for his amendments 184 and 185. They raise an important issue that was also pursued by Patrick Harvey when I gave evidence to this committee. Given the sheer scale and complexity of the programme of legislation expected in relation to Brexit, I think we need to recognise that it's almost inevitable we will need to lay some of our instruments in recess. In fact, as the committee will be aware, laying instruments in recess is not uncommon. But it's important to note that laying in recess does not ordinarily reduce the time available for parliamentary scrutiny, because standing orders preserve the amount of scrutiny time by excluding any recess period longer than four days. We all recognise that regulations under this bill will be made against a hard deadline, out of our control, against the backdrop of uncertainty. In these circumstances, it's appropriate for the bill to set out more about what should happen when instruments do need to be laid during recess. Therefore, while we agree with the sentiment behind Donald Cameron's amendments, the form of the amendments is the problem. Amendment 184 may in some circumstances actually delay when an explanatory statement must be provided, since not every day is a sitting day. Amendment 185 points in the direction of the right approach. I agree that the government should have to explain any decisions to lay instruments under this bill during recess. I'm not resisting that in the slightest. So what I want to undertake is to lodge amendments to this effect, to give effect to the proposals here at stage three, and on that basis I would hope that the committee, that either the amendments would not be moved, 184 and 185, or that the committee would reject them. 
Tavish Scott's amendments 41 and 43 would make any exercise of the power under section 13 subject to enhanced affirmative procedure. I've explained elsewhere we are reflecting on certain th section 13 and I'm sympathetic. I'll come back to the Parliament on the procedure at stage three, but I have indicated this morning that this forms part of the package of measures we're, which we're looking at at section 13. Section four, Amendment 44 would exclude regulations under section 13 from the saving provision to the consequences of failing to meet the 60 days laying requirement under the enhanced affirmative procedure. Like Donald Cameron's Amendment 183, adding the requirement to write to the Scottish Parliament where the Scottish ministers fail to comply with procedural requirements is unnecessary and helpful and actually breaks the established system. Procedural requirements like the 60 day rule are tried and tested procedural sanctions taken seriously by the government and scrutinized intensely by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Um, we would be called to account and required to report to the Parliament for any failures under this rule, and we'd expect to be so, and the procedure exists so to do. On Tavish Scott's Amendment 45, it requires Scottish ministers to consult the UK and devolved administrations on all enhanced affirmative regulations. I am very resistant to this for the grounds that I gave earlier when I discussed the issues of consultation. There are already, there are no relevant reserved areas or UK frameworks. Um, sorry, th this provision could be in areas where there are no relevant reserved area or UK framework. We could have an unnecessary level of bureaucracy and delay. We consult on legislative proposals that affect the other administrations under the memorandums of understanding in any event where there is a relevant interest. And in the terms of the establishment of frameworks, and I still anticipate that frameworks would be established, this would be built into the structure of the frameworks. Neil Bibby's Amendment 188 would change the words used to describe the consultation requirement. The language of the bill is introduced is well known, well understood. They impose a strong consultation requirement on Scottish ministers. It's not clear who would be appropriate in the abstract and administrative law will require the discretion on who to consult to be exercised fairly. I would want, not want to see the wording changed, and I invite the committee to reject this amendment. Amendment 191 by Dean Lockhart uh, would have a detrimental effect on the statutory consultation provision. It would remove, for example, the requirement to send copies of consultations to those being consulted. It would remove the requirements of regard to any representations they make. It would, however, replace this requirement that ministers disclose their relevant legal advice to an uncertain end. For that reason alone, it should be rejected. It would wreck entirely the proportionate processes set out in the bill for consulting on these instruments with the most significant policy implications, and it would result in less scrutiny and less consultation. However, I do find myself in the position of accepting two other amendments from Tavish Scott, 46 and 47. To add the reasons for considering the necessity test applies to a proposed exercise of the Section 11 power to matters on which statutory consultation is required as part of the enhanced procedure. However, on Tavish Scott's Amendment 53 on the fees and charges scrutiny procedures, I'm not clear to the purpose of the amendment and I'm very doubtful about its effect. It would add a reference to sections 11, 12 and 13 to section 19, but in the regulations under section 19 would not be made under those sections. Uh, and that would lead to, I think, simply a, a circle of confusion. I'd invite members not to support the amendment. Uh, I think I've made it clear that there are amendments that can be accepted. There are areas in which we want to do more work with members and to bring am amendments. And there are areas in this, regrettably, which the effect of the amendments would be massively detrimental. To the bill. Uh, we have indicated very strongly how we are trying to move to match requirements that the members of this committee are bringing and others are bringing, but there are some areas if we were to move in this direction, the bill couldn't operate at all. Thank you, Minister. And Jackson Carlaw to speak to Amendment 178 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, I realise that there is a desire to try and move matters forward, so I'll probably speak slightly more briefly to the amendment that I might earlier have anticipated doing. Uh, I did come to Parliament this morning and the first thing I was confronted with was a message in my inbox from a group called Praying for Politicians, who told me that today we include prayers for Jackson Carlow MSP, praying for five politicians each day. I, I don't know whether they'd followed the proceedings last night or whether they saw what the proceedings were to be today and thought a little bit of spiritual oomph might just help persuade uh, the more silently engaged members of the committee who I failed to persuade yesterday to, 
to really exercise their endeavour in, in consideration of my amendments to participate. Um, it's unusual because I think this is the first time that the Minister has demolished my amendments before I've had an opportunity to, to move them. And I, I did notice, to paraphrase him, that well-worn phrase that my amendments, he and his opinion, were too wee, too small and too stupid to make the enhanced affirmative procedure work. But, you know, nonetheless, uh, I do feel it appropriate that I, I seek to push forward with the amends, at least in a, in a restricted form. These amendments would provide greater scrutiny for ministers' new powers by making all regulations subject to the affirmative procedure. And 178 and 179 should, of course, be read alongside one another. Sections 11, 112 and 13, 1 give ministers power to make provision consistent with EU legislation. Section 14 sets out how that is scrutinised and has drafted the bill breaks regulations into two categories. Some specific instances set out in 14.2 where the affirmative procedure is required and everything else in 14.3 which is negative only. 14.5 sets out some further conditions for some and only some of the regulations covered in 14.2. So by removing section 14.3, there is only provision to submit these provisions to the positive procedure, effectively ensuring that the Scottish Parliament must vote on any provision created under sections 11, 1, 12 and 13, 1. Um, the Law Society of Scotland agrees with the need for ministers to consult before using these powers. The Society's comment on Section 15 and its response to the Scottish Parliament's Finance and Constitution Committee states, we agree with the general proposition that Scottish ministers should consult with interested parties before making regulations under Section 14.5. Um, however, Scottish ministers must ensure that there is adequate time to consider such draft regulations. So if there is general agreement that consultation and scrutiny are good things, then why not expand their application? And it's difficult to see why the three basic provisions of 14.2 A, B and C uh, are covered by the need to bring changes before Parliament under 14.5, but the three subsequent are covered in 14.2 D, E, F and G. This amendment would therefore increase the role of Parliament in scrutinising regulations and increase the powers we have to hold ministers to account and choose what regulations are appropriate after we leave the EU. And this is clearly a different regi accountability regime mm -hmm. to the European Withdrawal Bill. I, I think that's appropriate. We are a unicameral parliament, uh, a unicameral chamber, and the procedures for scrutinising secondary legislation are accordingly less robust. This would ensure that this parliament was properly accoutred to undertake the task in hand. Uh, a convener, the only final comment I would make is having spoken on health in the Parliament for many years, I'm familiar with repetitive injury strain, and therefore I would very much encourage those people when considering my amendment to consider using their alternative arm for the rest of the business in hand this afternoon and this evening, just in order to save that damaged limb that has had so much work to do in putting down so many of these well-considered amendments, which I've been very happy to speak to. Thank you. OK. Thank you. Um, Tavish got to speak to Amendment 41 and other amendments in the group. I'm still slightly puzzled by that last reference, but I'm really not going to go there, um, convener. Um, can I, first of all, take the Minister's point with regard to 40, amendments 41 and 43, um, that he's alive to their uh, purpose? I appreciate uh, that. My principle is... As uh, the Minister will well understand, I appreciate that colleagues are uh, probably heartily sick of hearing this argument now, is that none of the keep pay powers should be exercised by a negative instrument. They should all undergo the enhanced affirmative procedure, and this committee uh, could indeed add requirements to the bill to make sure those orders uh, cannot be made that cause difficulty elsewhere. So that's the purpose behind 41 and 43. And, um, I welcome further consideration uh, of those and uh, remove those in that spirit. Um, Amendment 44 means that it is not possible for ministers to avoid the provisions of the super affirmative procedure for section 13 powers, um, which is the section obviously that uh, many of us are most concerned by in the bill. Uh, section 14, subsection 7 to 9 offer ministers various ways and routes to avoid following the super affirmative scrutiny. This amendment 44 prevents this shortcut from being available to ministers for any of the keep pace powers they seek in, in uh, section 13. And I, I hope uh, it would be the, the amendment would be seen as that. It has, after all, been strongly argued that 30, section 13 is an unsatisfactory vehicle for the keep pace powers, but my amendment at least preserves the super affirmative procedure for law uh, changes. I listened to what the minister said on 45. I think he, he may protest too much. The, the um, 
on his argument about uh, uh, bureaucracy, and I entirely take the point that none of us, uh, well, most of us do not wish to be here from first principles, but I do think it's uh, possible for the different administrations and governments of, of, uh, of these nations to agree what is and what is not subject to consultation. So I didn't uh, read into 45 quite the dire um, uh, protestations of gloom that the, the minister did uh, in his uh, remarks uh, earlier on. I'm grateful to his consideration for 46 and 47. I will not delay members on that. And 53, um, by my way of reading it, Amendment 53 ensures that Section 13 orders, which is, uh, I hope the minister would accept my principal concern, those orders are always subject to the affirmative procedure. I take it, I take his point that the, if, if we have, if I've drafted that in a way which has uh, un, an unbeknownst consequences to me, then I accept that criticism, but uh, the purpose behind 53 was to ensure that Section 13 orders are always subject to that affirmative procedure, and I would so move, Premier. Thank you. Donald Cameron to speak to Amendment 183 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. I um, do intend to press forward with 183. Um, I think it's important that it is the Scottish Parliament rather than the uh, presiding officer uh, to whom um, that the explanation in subsection 8 should be given. Um, the primacy of this Parliament is, is important, and uh, for that reason, I think it, it, it would be useful to um, press on with that. Um, in relation to 184 and 185, I do um, note the assurances given by the Minister in relation to the, the sentiment, if not the, the form of those uh, current amendments. And for that reason, I will not be moving either 184 or 185. Uh, when the time comes, convener. <clears throat> Thank you. And you'll be to speak to Amendment 188 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. We've established that the bill in its present form grants significant regulation making powers to Scottish ministers. It's draft Scottish statutory instruments making uh, regulations under Section 11, 1, uh, Section 12, or Section 13, one of the bill, which contain a provision falling under Section 14, subjects in 2A, B or C cannot be laid before the Scottish Parliament unless there has been consultation in accordance with Section 15. Amendment 188 in my name requires Scottish Ministers to consult not with persons they consider appropriate as provided for in Section 15 as it stands, but with appropriate persons. There is a difference. It should not be for the Scottish Government and the Scottish Government alone to decide who it is appropriate to consult with over a draft SSI relating to this bill. Um, there are also a number of other amendments in this group that um, I, I will support as uh, and associate my comments with what James Kelly said earlier, um, specifically around those amendments which will enhance parliamentary scrutiny and accountability. And I hope members will support the amendment in my name, 188. Thank you. Uh, Dean Lockhart to speak to Amendment 191 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. My Amendment 191 seeks to improve parliamentary scrutiny. I do note there is an overlap with other, other amendments proposed by members and indeed the proposal submitted by the Minister. Amendment 191 would revise Section 15 and require ministers to provide Parliament with additional information and additional documentation setting out materials relevant to the Parliament's consideration of regulations to be issued by ministers including, I won't go into detail, but including relevant legal advice and an explanation of how the proposed regulations to be issued by the ministers would amend existing law. As I said, this amendment should be read together with the other proposals, and uh, the purpose of my amendment is to increase parliamentary scrutiny. Thank you. Thank you. Is any other member of the committee wish to contribute at this stage? Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you. Just uh, very briefly, uh, I welcome the fact that the Minister is supporting 46 and 47. I think that's uh, very positive. Uh, I'm uh, grateful that there's uh, some proposal being brought forward on the question of uh, orders being, uh, in instruments being laid during recess. Uh, but I think my initial reaction on reading the specific amendments was, yes, something needs to be done, but is this it? Uh, and I'm, I'm pleased that the, the minister is, appears to be making a, a, a fairly clear commitment that he will bring forward uh, an alternative approach to address that issue at stage three. Um, the last thing I want to say about this is that, about this group as a whole, is that 
my instinct very often is to increase the level of scrutiny to which uh, statutory instruments or, or regulations are subject. Uh, we need to balance that natural instinct of, of Parliament to want to hold ministers to, to stronger account against the volume of work that Parliament is going to be asked to do over the, uh, the coming period. Um, and although I might have been very open to supporting some of the other amendments that specify levels of scrutiny in relation to regulations in this group, in the light of the fact that we have already agreed a sifting process which will allow Parliament to decide for itself the level of scrutiny that will be applied and to increase the level of scrutiny that will be ap applied. What I would like to see is the detail of what the government is willing to agree to uh, in relation to the amendment that's already been passed, what changes it wants to make to that, uh, and then perhaps to revisit uh, any outstanding concerns around making specific scrutiny requirements at stage three. So I'm, I'm saying this on the record so that hopefully our presiding officer uh, might be minded to select for debate at stage three amendments which members still think are necessary if in the light of those discussions around the sifting process, uh, people still want to specify a level of scrutiny for particular types of amendments. But I, I think that we should wait until we see what, uh, uh, what the, the, the sifting process is gonna end up as, what further changes the government wants to persuade us to make uh, before, we, before we reach a, a final view on specific uh, 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 scrutiny procedures uh, in, in some of the other amendments in this group. I hope that's clear. It Thank may you. not be, I don't know. Thank you. Willie Coffey. Jackson Carlo, uh, despite the entertaining way that he presented them to us to lure us into supporting them, I think would uh, effectively mean that all the regulations would then be subject to the super affirmative procedure, effectively, in my view, making the, the bill unworkable. A consultation would need to be, to be held in the draft order, and that, of course, needs 60 days to elapse to, plus the time to consider all the representations that were made thereafter. So I think that you know, rather than helping the bill, those amendments are intended, in my view, to make the bill unworkable. So I, I, I think we, we shouldn't support those two particular amendments. Okay, I'm not any other member can say they want to contribute. So, Adam Tompkins, to wind up, please. Uh, th thank you, Convener. Um, uh, contrary to what Mr Coffey just said, I don't think any of the amendments uh, in this group are designed to make the bill inoperable. On the contrary, they are designed to enable, in a unicameral parliament, effective and robust parliamentary uh, scrutiny. Um, uh, but subject to that observation, I welcome the generality of the Minister's constructive approach to a number of the amendments in this group. I have nothing further to add. Okay, in which case uh, we move on to um, deciding on some of these amendments. The question is that Amendment 175 be agreed, are we all agreed? Okay, there will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 175, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call Amendment 38 in the name of Neil Finlay, already debated with Amendment 149, James Kelly, to move or not move. Move. The question is that Am Amendment 38 be agreed. Are we all agreed? There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 38, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 176 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 175. Jamie Green to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 176 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 39, in the name of James Kelly, already debated with Amendment 175. And at this stage, I remind members, if Amendment 39 is agreed, I cannot call Amendments 177, 178, 40 and 41. James Kelly, to move or move. not move? Move, convener. The question is, Amendment 39 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yeah. There will be a division. <clears throat> 
Those in favour, please raise their hand. Those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 39, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call Amendment 177 in the name of the Minister, already debated with the Member. Amendment 175, Minister, to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 177 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. I call Amendment 178 in the name of Jackson Carlaw, already debated with Amendment 175. And I remind members that if Amendment 178 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 40. Jackson Carlaw to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 178 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. <clears throat> Catch that. Uh, uh, um, amendment 178 uh, votes in favour four, 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 five against six. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Amendment. I call amendment 40 in the name of Neil Finlay. I read debate with amendment 149. James Kelly to move or not move. Move. The question is: Amendment 40 be agreed? Are we all agreed? There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise your hand. <coughs> Those against, please raise your hand. Amendment 40, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. Call Amendment 41 in the name of Tavish Scott. Already debated with Amendment 175. Tavish Scott, to move or not move? Move, Convener. The question is, Amendment 41 be agreed or well agreed? There will be a division. Uh, those in favour, please raise their hand. Those against, please raise their hand. Amendment 41, there were five votes for, six against. The, the amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call Amendment 42 in the name of Neil Finlay. We debated with Amendment 149, James Kelly, to move or not move? Move. The question is, Amendment 42 be agreed, are we all agreed? There will be division. All these in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. Amendment 42, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call Amendment 179 in the name of Jackson Carlaw, already debated with Amendment 175. I remind members that if Amendment 179 is agreed to, I cannot call. Amendment 179. Jackson Carlow to move or not move? For a final time, move. The question is that Amendment 179 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, there will be a division. Uh, those in favour, please raise their hand. Those against, please raise their hand. On, on Amendment 179, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call Amendment 180 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with 100, Amendment 175. Jamie Green to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 180 be agreed or we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 73 in the name of, sorry, 43 in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated with Amendment 175. Tavish Scott to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 43 be agreed. Are we all agreed? There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 43, there were five votes for, six against. Amendment 43, therefore, is not agreed to. Call Amendment 181, the name of Jamie Green, already debated for Amendment 175. Jamie Green to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 181 be agreed, or are we all agreed? There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On amendment 181, there were three votes for, eight against. The amendment, the amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call, me, I call amendment 182 in the name of Jamie Green. Already debated with amendment 175. Jamie Green to move or not move? To move. 
question is that Amendment 182 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now call Amendment 183 in the name of Donald Cameron. Already debated with Amendment 175. Donald Cameron to move or not move? Move. Nice. Que question is that Amendment 183 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. Amendment, on Amendment 183, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. And we call Amendment 184 in the name of Donald Cameron, already debated with Amendment 175. Donald Cameron, to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 44 in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated with Amendment 175, Tavish Scott, Tavish Scott to move or not move? Moved, Kavir. The question is that Amendment 44 be agreed, or we all agreed? Agreed. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 44, there were five votes for, six against. Uh, and therefore, Amendment 44 is not agreed to. I call Amendment 185 in the name of Donald Cameron, already debated with Amendment 175. Donald Cameron, to move or not move? To not move. Thank you. <coughs> I now call Amendment 186 in the name of Morris Golden, in a group on its own. Morris Golden, to move and to speak to Amendment 186. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, my amendment refers to quarterly reports on the use of power. Um, members will see the specific entries, so, so no need to go through them in detail. The amendment requires ministers to make regular reports on deficiencies they have identified and every quarter publish how many there are and how many the Scottish Parliament is expected to see soon. And this is an instance where deviation from the EU withdrawal bill is justified by the fact we are a unicameral chamber and the House of Lords in particular has a strong role in scrutinising delegated powers. We have no equivalent, so it's important that there are good processes in place for transparency and clarity on the scale of deficiencies and ministerial action to address them. This amendment is in keeping with previous amendment um, to section seven, on the challenges to validity of retained devolved EU law. And uh, in that respect, I would urge the committee to look upon it favourably, and I move the amendment. Any other members of the committee wish to speak on this amendment? Neil Bibby. Just, uh, thank you, Convener. I'd just like to indicate support for Maurice Goldman's uh, amendment at this stage. Uh, under the circumstances requiring the Scottish Government to produce a quarterly report in relation to the use of Section 11 powers does not seem to be onerous or excessive. It seems to be measured and appropriate. Those reports would be useful in reassuring Parliament and the public that powers granted to ministers in what I remind the committee is an exceptional piece of legislation are being used appropriately. And I support the amendment in Maurice Golden's name. Thank you. Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Convener. Um, similar sentiment to, to Neil Bibby. I, I think I'm still uh, slightly amused by the uh, inconsistency with which our Conservative colleagues apply the consistency principle. Um, however, I, I don't think that the, uh, the burden uh, of complying with this amendment sounds particularly onerous, uh, so I can, uh, I can see merit in the, the principle that motivates it, uh, and I would be interested to hear uh, the Minister's response, uh, uh, it, it, it does seem to me that the, that the level of work involved in complying with it wouldn't necessarily be uh, intolerable. Does any other member wish to speak? No other member wishes to speak. Minister? Um, the Minister, it's, if you wish to respond. Yes, um, thank you, Convener. Uh, there is a later amendment which has essentially the same effect, and I had tended to favour the later amendment because I think it will give the opportunity for some flexibility in this matter. Um, secondly, I think the, the member slightly misunderstands the role of the committees of the parliament, and particularly the uh, delegated powers uh, committee, which will receive this information on a regular basis. The parliamentary authorities will have this information on a regular basis. There is already a commitment to an information flow with the parliamentary authorities. 
Um, if the member had uh, worked with the other Tory member who was proposing a later resolution, then it might have been possible just to meld these into a general reporting function. I'm sorry that hasn't happened, but I'm not going to get overexcited about it. And you know, if, they, if the committee wants to see uh, quarterly reports, so be it. There isn't a, 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 an unlimited resource available to the government. It will be uh, very much uh, under pressure because of the pressures of Brexit. And we now know from the, um, from the uh, Chancellor's statement yesterday that the uh, uh, allocation of funds on Brexit will not be done with any great generosity or spirit. Uh, but in these circumstances, I think I have other things, that, more important things to worry me at this stage. So if the committee feels inclined to support this, then uh, we'll accept it within the bill. Maurice Golden to wind up. I think that this is part of uh, scrutiny which is essential and ultimately uh, reporting to Parliament is critical. The, um, the, in relation to the EU uh, withdrawal bill, clearly if we had a second revising chamber, then the consistency of the argument could be applied equally across the legal provisions of both this bill and the EU withdrawal bill. However, as is very much apparent or should be apparent to members of this committee and indeed members of this parliament, we have a separate system and therefore on occasion where scrutiny and uh, uh, ministerial accountability has to be considered, we cannot apply the exact same rationale and process. And I move the amendment. Okay, the member intends to press. Therefore, the question is that amendment 186 be agreed or we all agreed? Yes. Everyone's agreed, okay. Yes. Oh, sorry. The question is that section 14 be agreed or we all agreed? No. Your opposition is noted. A comment 187, the name of Ross Greer, already debated with amendment 174. Ross Greer to move or not move? Move, convener. The question is that amendment 187 be agreed to, or all agreed? No. Nope. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. Those who wish to abstain, please raise their, raise their hand. On amendment 187, there were six votes for, none against, five abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to. I call amendment 188 in the name of Neil Bibby, already debated with amendment 175, and I remind members, if amendment 188 is agreed to, I cannot call amendments 45 and 189. Neil Bibby to move or not move? Move. The question is that un amendment 188 be agreed, or we all agreed? There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. Amendment 188, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call Amendment 45 in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated with Amendment 175, and I remind members that if Amendment 45 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 189. Have we got to move or not move? Move, Convener. The question is that Amendment 45 be agreed to, are we all agreed? There will be a division. Um, those in favour, please raise their hand. Those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 45, there were three votes for, eight against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call Amendment 189, the name of Jamie Green, already debated the Amendment 175. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Uh, convener, in light of the Minister's opposition to scrutiny of his uh, new regula regulatory powers, uh, I move this amendment. The question is Amendment 189 be agreed to or well agreed? Yes. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 189, there were five, four, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. Now call Amendment 190 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 175. Jamie Green to move or not move? Uh, for the same reasons I move. 
The question is Amendment 190. We agreed or we all agreed? There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against, please raise your hand. On Amendment 190, there are five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. Now call Amendment 191, the name of Dean Lockhart, already debated with Amendment 175. And I remind members that if Amendment 191 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 46 and 47. Dean Lockhart, to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 46 in the name of Tavis Scott, already debated with Amendment 175. Tavis Scott, to move or not move? Move, come here. The question is that Amendment 46 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 47, the name of Tavish Scott, already debated with Amendment 175. Tavish Scott, to move or not move? Move, Convener. The question is that Amendment 47 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 192, in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 175. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 182 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On amendment 192, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The question is that section 15 be agreed to or all agreed. Your opposition is noted. I call amendment 48 in the name of Neil Finlay, already debated with amendment 149. Uh, James Kelly to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 48 be agreed, are we all agreed? Amen. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 48, there are five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call amendments 193, in the name of Jamie Green, grouped with amendments 194, 195, 49, 50, 51 and 196. Jamie Green to move amendment 193 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, at the risk of being accused of uh, repetition, uh, perhaps deviation or even hesitation, uh, my amendments once again seek to remove ambiguity from the bill, in this case section 16. Uh, specifically, uh, Amendment 193 looks to replace the word in their opinion. Uh, you'll find that on page 14 of the bill, subsection 2A. Uh, in their opinion, once again, just leaves simply too much room for interpretation. Uh, my wording uh, change seeks to tighten subsection 2 in that it is not just in their opinion, there being the Scottish ministers, but that the statement they make when an instrument or draft is laid uh, has indeed been given due diligence and ensures that ministers have taken reasonable steps to confirm that the instrument does no more than is appropriate. Uh, the phrases carrying out due diligence and taking reasonable steps are well established and com commonly used legal terms to tighten any doubt over the subjectivity of the term in their opinion and I hope it is welcomed uh, by members. Amendment 194 uh, is another tightening change. In its current form, the wording is details. Uh, I seek to replace that with notable findings. Details does not always include findings or important findings. So, in fact, superfluous or unimportant findings could still be constituted as details. Details is vague. By changing the word details to key and notable findings, it technically aligns with my previous amendment. Uh, on the level of detail that must be presented in the statement that the Minister lays and also conforms to the language that I propose to use in Amendment 193. I hope uh, members will agree that this indeed tightens the ambiguity in Section 16. Thank you. Thank you. Dean Lockhart to speak to Amendment 195 and other amendments in the group. Thank you. Uh, can be an amendment 195 is a technical amendment which uh, seeks to change a reference to the consultation in the singular and replace it with references to any consultations in order to clarify that multiple persons or, or uh, organisations can be consulted under 
section 15. Thank you. Uh, Tavish Scott to speak to Amendment 49. Are there amendments in the group? Thank you, Convener. These are about the these amendments are about the explanatory statements, as Dean Lockhart and uh, Jamie Green have, have uh, already mentioned. In terms of the importance of the government of the day making clear uh, its intention and indeed its uh, purpose uh, in the measures it's bringing forward, uh, new powers are being allocated around the administrations of the UK by this process that. Uh, different parliaments and legislators are going through, and extensive order-making pa powers are being proposed for ministers in all of those administrations. And therefore, we want to make sure that through this amendment, uh, we, this parliament will have the opportunity to make sure that ministers, in many ways, lead by example, that they consider the impact of their proposals on the operation of the UK single market and require them to publish their responses to their consultation with other administrations. We think that's an important part of the explanatory statements that helps any parliament do its uh, duties uh, appropriately and properly and fully. The, this amendment um, 49 uh, will be uh, the way to get reference to the importance of that uh, UK single market on the face of the bill. Amendment 50 together with 51 prevents ministers from shortcutting processes for proposals under section 13, which um, I believe is important. The bill currently provides in section 16.7 that ministers can avoid all of the requirements to make statements on necessity, equalities and consultation that are contained in section 16226. This amendment means that the shortcut and opt-outs from this reporting requirement is not available for powers under section 13, which I uh, suspect across all political parties we've agreed is extremely important. And amendment 50 provide, uh, removes rather the permission to shortcut from subsection 7 Amendment 50 specifically requires Section 13 proposals to have the written justifications that, again, I suspect many members would seek. And on that basis, Convener, I would so move. Thank you. And Neil Bibby to speak to Amendment 196 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Amendment 196 in my name and the other amendments in the group introduce further checks and balances into the bill. Section 16 of the bill applies when SSI or a draft SSSI containing regulations under section 11.1, section 12 or section 13.1 is to be laid before Parliament. For clarity, these sections relate to deficiencies arising from withdrawal from the EU, complying with international obligations and the power to make provision corresponding to EU law after exit day. My amendment makes clear that an explanatory statement for a relevant SSI or draft SSI must be made in writing and published. It removes from the face of the bill the provision that Scottish ministers decide in an appropriate way to publish those statements. It is a small but significant amendment, and I would ask committee members give it their full consideration. Convener a number of other amendments in this group, which, in my judgment, enhance scrutiny and improve transparency. And as members are aware, there are no preemptions in this grouping. I will therefore support all other amendments in this grouping. Thank you. Any other member wish to speak on this group? Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Convener. Just uh, in relation to Tavish Scott's Amendment 49, I can entirely understand why he wants to place uh, a significant emphasis uh, on uh, any potential impact on the operation uh, of what's generally referred to as the single market uh, in goods and services within the UK. That is an important factor. I, I don't think I'm comfortable, though, in suggesting that it must have a, a so much higher a status in the consideration of all of the factors that might be uh, impacted upon that it is referred to in the legislation and not other factors. Um, it may well be the case uh, that in considering uh, any regulations or, or instruments uh, that contain regulations under this section, the government and the parliament may in future be faced with a, a conflict between maintaining uh, the operation of that single market and maintaining uh, the social and environmental protections, uh, which are also important to us, uh, which we've also talked about including within the, the text of the bill. The government would be foolish, I think, to uh, lodge a draft of an instrument that doesn't contain some detail on all of the impacts that the regulations will have. Uh, and it will be up to Parliament to decide to what extent we want to question ministers on all of those impacts uh, and whether, in fact, we want to uh, approve or reject a, 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 an instrument that ministers lay before Parliament. But I, I think we should do so in consideration of the range of factors that may be impacted 
rather than elevating one to a higher status. Thank you, Roger. Any other member from the committee wish to take part in this debate? Okay, no one else does. Minister. Thank you uh, uh, very much. At the outset, I could say that I, Amendment 195 by Dean Lockhart, which I, I don't think makes things any clearer, but uh, I, equally I'm not going to go to the stake for the, for the sake of a plural, so I will accept Dean Lockhart's Amendment 195. Um, as far as Neil Bibby's Amendment 196 is concerned, I, I am worried that we're taking out something that's clearly understood, uh, has meaning, and as meaning in other statutes, such manner as Scottish ministers consider appropriate. Uh, this is also entirely consistent with the UK bill. Uh, and in these circumstances, I think this is understandable and consistent and shouldn't be changed for something that uh, isn't, uh, is going to be vaguer. Um, amendments 193 and 194 by Jamie Green present us with a very interesting issue, which I, I want to address. Uh, the first part of this is that the con continuity bill contains a clear process for laying explanatory statements. These amendments would actually make it unclear. Amendment 194, for example, replaced the requirement to set out the details of a constitution with one to set out its key and notable findings. Uh, that is badly defined, it's loose, it's weak, uh, and it would be subject to endless interpretation. Uh, the Parliament would not get the information that it will get in the light of what is in this bill. But there's a more interesting issue in this amendment because uh, Mr. Uh, Green wants to take the words out in their opinion. He wants to take the words out in their opinion where it relates to Scottish ministers. But these are exactly the same words that exist in the UK bill. So the UK bill is being approved by Mr. Green's colleagues on the ground that you should take the opinion of UK ministers, but he is endeavouring to change it here because he isn't willing to take the opinion of Scottish ministers. And I think that's an interesting approach to this bill. That in actual fact, what is good enough uh, for his colleagues at Westminster in terms of how a minister would operate is not good enough for him when he comes into this chamber. I'm sorry to hear that because I think his amendments are wrong and weak, but I also think they display a mindset which I think we should uh, worry about, uh, particularly in approach of a Scottish member to a Scottish bill in a Scottish parliament. Now, in terms of amendments 49 to 51 from Tavish Scott, um, at the risk of repeating myself, and I hate repeating myself as uh, Mr. Scott knows, um, we have been here before on this issue today. Um, and I think uh, Patrick Harvey's remarks are, are helpful. But I, I do understand where Mr. Scott is coming from, and I'm, I'm honestly not being patronising that. I understand and I agree with it, the element. But I think there, are this, there is this triple lock, which I want to explain to Mr. Scott again. It may make no difference in terms of him moving it, but if it did make a difference, I'd be pleased. First of all, uh, there could be, um, obviously, I agree, implications for other parts of the UK if Scotland is to update EU law in a way they don't mirror. But we will, first of all, be bound by international obligations in the normal way. And secondly, if there are UK frameworks, those frameworks will contain a reference to this and how they operate. Um, but I've also stressed it is up to this Parliament at the end of the day to decide how it operates and to decide if it wishes to do this. So I think there are three strong reasons, which I have now repeated three times, for not taking this approach. And Mr Harvey has added the reasons in terms of what is necessary to do and the changes it may require to have. So um, it would greatly please me if he doesn't press this, but if he does press it, I do hope members will not support it, uh, as they haven't supported it on previous occasions. Uh, and I think those are all the points I wish to make, uh, Convener. Thank you, Minister. Jamie Green to wind up. Thank you, Convener. I'd like to thank members who uh, gave a contribution in this short grouping. I think there's been very reasonable and considered suggestions uh, and amendments, and I do thank uh, some of the uh, members of the committee for already uh, in advance agreeing their support to some of them. I think that's a very welcome approach, a very pragmatic approach. Uh, I'm a little bit disappointed, however, by the Minister's comments. Uh, you know, this bill is going through 231 amendments. It will see very substantive differences in how we will see it at stage three from when it was introduced. Uh, its comparison to the drafting of the UK withdrawal bill is simply like comparing apples and pears. This will not be the same bill, and we have to approach it that I approach this bill with, uh, uh, entirely earnestly uh, in looking at it line by line, as every other member should have done, and as the Scottish Conservatives did in great detail, which is why we are sitting here uh, in the third session in the second night of it. So, very disappointed by the Minister's simplistic view 
on this bill and the wording of our amendments. We're treating it in its own right, and I think we're right to do so. Uh, I also find it intriguing that he thinks that the words key and notable are loose and weak terms, but the words detail is not. I think key notable is quite profoundly specific, in my view. Uh, so I look forward to hopefully receiving support of the committee members in these amendments. Whether you want to press or withdraw? I press uh, 193. Thank you. The question is amendment 193. Be agreed to or well agreed? There will be a division. Um, all those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 193, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call Amendment 194 in the name of Jamie Green. I already debated with Amendment 193. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that 194 be agreed to, have all agreed? There will be division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On 194, there were five votes for, six against. Uh, the, the amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call amendment 195 in the name of Dean Lockhart. Already debated with amendment 193. De Dean Lockhart, to move or not move? Uh, move, please. The question is amendment 195 be agreed to. Well agreed. We are agreed. I call amendment 49 in the name of Tavish Scott. Already debated with amendment 193. Tavish Scott, to move or not move? Given the certainty of defeat, not moved. Thank you. The, I call Amendment 50 in the name of Tavish Scott. I've already debated with Amendment 193. Tavish Scott, move, to move, move or again. not move? Same again? Sorry. Not I, moved. Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 51 in the name of Tavish Scott. I've already debated with 190, Amendment 193. Tavish Scott, to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 196, in the name of Neil Bibby, already debated with Amendment 193. Neil Bibby, to move or not move? Move. The question is Amendment 196. Be agreed or we all agreed? There will be division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 196, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The question is that Section 16 be agreed to or we all agreed? Your opposition is noted. I now call Amendment 197 in the name of Jamie Green, group with Amendment 198. And I would point out that if Amendment 197 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 198. Jamie Green to move Amendment 197 and spoke to both amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Veenar. Um, this uh, amendment uh, might seem quite drastic. It seeks, seeks to take out subsection 2 uh, of section 17, which is the requirement for Scottish Minister's consent to certain subordinate legislation. Uh, I, I've done it for this, in this way for a reason. Uh, I'd like to probe the Minister, hopefully in his comments, uh, to provide some clarification on this subsection. Because in my view, it seems to allow a veto over subordinate legislation uh, to Scottish Ministers. So I think before I decide whether I move or withdraw the amendment, I'd like the Minister, if possible, to address some questions and points of this. What is the intent of this subsection? It says that subordinate legislation, to the extent that it contains devolved provision, is of no effect unless the consent of Scottish Ministers was obtained before it was made, confirmed or approved. How is this likely, for example, to impact any common frameworks? Uh, in the UK. Does it allow Scottish ministers to prevent UK ministers uh, acting via subordinate legislation uh, after approval has been given or only if approval has been given? And does it mean, therefore, that all UK subordinate legislation will only be effective if consent has been given by Scottish ministers? My concern with subsection 2, as I read it, that it effectively means Scottish ministers, ministers can block subordinate legislation which is applicable in Scotland because it, chooses, because it chooses not to, for whatever reason, prior to being introduced. Now, that sounds like a worrying scenario to me, which puts, in my view, potential political conflicts of opinion before the application of law. My instinct, therefore, is to have it removed unless I can be persuaded otherwise. To speak to Amendment 198 and other amendments in the group.
Sorry, Rose Greer. Thank you, uh, Convener. Happy to speak to Amendment 198. As it currently stands, Section 17 requires only the consent of Scottish ministers to be given when a UK minister is changing an area of devolved law using a, a statutory instrument. Amendment 198 requires the consent of the Scottish Parliament is granted as well. This is in some ways, of course, the opposite of what Amendment 197 from Jamie Green uh, seeks to achieve, thus the preemption. But it's very much in keeping with the arguments made by Conservative colleagues, uh, particularly Mr Tompkins and indeed uh, Liberal Democrat and Labour colleagues as well, in regards to the relative power of legislature and executive. Like my previous amendments on the sifting procedure for statutory instruments, the purpose of this amendment is to give the Parliament its rightful place and ensure that procedures are as democratically robust as possible. As it stands, the bill would allow ministers of a minority government to give consent while a majority of Parliament were opposed. The amendment brings us closer to our recent constitutional tradition through the Seal Convention of seeking parliamentary consent. Um, any other members want to speak? I know that Adam Tompkins does. Any other members wish to speak? Patrick Harvey and uh, Adam Onyo. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, uh, just a simple question which I'd like the Minister to reflect on um, uh, when he responds to the amendments in this group. And the question is this, that Section 17.2, um, which is the focus um, uh, of both the amendments in this group, but, um, uh, is one which it, it strikes me is difficult to justify in terms of legislative competence. And I wonder what the Minister's um, uh, take on this is, why the Scottish Government thinks that this is somehow within competence. Because what Section 17.2 does is it seeks to provide in an act of the Scottish Parliament for how Ministers of the Crown make delegated legislation through the Westminster Parliament. Um, and that strikes me as straightforwardly and manifestly reserved, unless I've missed something in the Scotland Act. So I have a simple question on this, uh, Convener, which I'd like the Minister to reflect on, which is to explain his view, or indeed the government's view, as to how Section 17, Subsection 2 is within legislative competence. Thank you. Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, Jamie Green seems concerned uh, in moving his amendment uh, that it would, uh, that uh, Subsection 2 would uh, give Scottish ministers the ability to block uh, any uh, subordinate legislation that was operating in Scotland passed by UK ministers, if only if only we, we had the, the ability to do so. Uh, we don't. It clearly states that it's uh, to the extent that it contains devolved provisions. This is purely about uh, matters which are within the uh, remit of this parliament, within the, the purpose of this parliament is, is to uh, hold ministers to account uh, in terms of devolved functions. Uh, and that's why I think Ross Greer's uh, amendment improves it. It is about uh, ensuring that this parliament is able to hold ministers accountable uh, for the decisions that they make, including uh, consent that they would give under uh, Section, two, uh, 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 Section 17.2 uh, of the bill. Uh, and I hope that uh, members will agree uh, that if, uh, if consent is to be sought, if it is possible to be granted, it should be granted with the agreement of this parliament, not of ministers alone. James Kelly. Thank you, Convener. As Adam Tonkin says, the, the, sub, the substance of these two amendments focuses on mm -hmm. Section 17.2 with two contrasting approaches. Uh, I very much prefer the approach outlined by Ross Greer in his, his speech and in his amendment, mm -hmm. uh, which gives the Scottish Parliament the power uh, in relation to consent uh, rather than the approach of uh, taking away the consent from Scottish ministers. I think it's appropriate that, Scot that, that, that this should be focused around the Parliament. As such, I support uh, Amendment 198 and oppose Amendment 197. Thank you. Any other member want to speak? No. Minister? Yes, um, let me address uh, Adam Com Tompkins' points immediately, of course. Uh, this doesn't prevent UK ministers from doing anything. It simply prevents what they do of having effect. And it is incompetence because it only, well, Mr. Mr. Tompkins is a constitutional lawyer. I thought he would like the subtlety of that point, but clearly he, on, he only likes his own subtlety, not other people's. Uh, and the, um, it, uh, it only affects devolved matters, and it is entirely with incompetence, and we will argue that very vigorously. Um, to address, however, Jamie Green's point, uh, I have to, to make it clear that I welcome the opportunity to uh, exp explore this section, and I, I can't accept either amendment, and I know, you know that will upset people and may well result in a defeat in one or other of them, but I want to explain precisely why that is at this stage. 
Uh, let me deal with Jamie Green's amendment. That is the, if I may use this term, uh, the less uh, attractive of the two. Um, as it stands, UK ministers can make or, uh, orders in devolved areas. Uh, we support that. We can see there will be circumstances in which a UK-wide approach to fixing deficiencies will be the best approach. We've constantly said that. That is current, what we currently do with transpositions under the European Communities Act. However, the UK bill does not require formal consent from devolved ministers when powers are exercised in devolved areas. Now, the Scottish and Welsh governments have proposed amendments to that effect, but these be, have been res resisted by the UK government so far. Hence, Section 17 of the bill, in effect, requires UK ministers to seek formal consent from Scottish ministers in such circumstances. And it follows I couldn't accept Mr Green's amendment, which would defeat the purpose of that section. And uh, Mr Green asks me, do I believe that uh, uh, Scottish ministers should have the power to stop UK ministers uh, 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 um, exercising their rights? Yes, I do believe that's the case. This is a legislator, and there are devolved powers for this legislator, and we have the right to exercise those. And now we can, of course, agree to other people exercising them on our behalf if we so consent. But we cannot have that imposed upon us, to use a word that was much used earlier today and yesterday. Uh, and therefore, this clause makes it clear that we will not have that imposed. They may do what they wish, but they cannot have effect unless we say so. Now, we have to turn to Ross Greer's amendment. We have considered carefully whether parliamentary consent should also be required to such regulations. And that is a, a debate that we should have. I think it's a, a, a much uh, uh, more closely argued debate than the one I've just uh, indicated to Jamie Green. But the government has come down on the side of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committees and the Finance and Constitution Committee's conclusion on the UK bill. That the statutory consent should be from ministers, but there should be a mechanism for Parliament to scrutinise ministers' plans before such consent is given. This won't be ministers alone, in, in Patrick Harvey's phrase. Uh, the Parliament will scrutinise ministers' plans before such consent is given. And this was the conclusion of two of the Parliament's committees, including this one. That approach keeps clear the accountability of Scottish ministers to this Parliament for their decisions and the accountability for, of UK ministers to Westminster for the exercise of their powers. It doesn't cut across that. Scottish Government and parliamentary officials have been working on a protocol for parliamentary scrutiny in circumstances where orders would be made under powers in the UK Bill, but the consent of Scottish ministers is required. The draft protocol seeks to ensure that the approval of the Scottish Parliament to the Scottish Minister's consent to the exercise of the Scottish Parliament's power is obtained, so the Parliament is involved I I again in that way. The draft protocol should be available, I believe, to ministers and members shortly, as shortly as possible would, in my view, be desirable, given a debate on this. And I believe that having joint working protocols on such matters is the best route. So I have to urge the committee to reject both of those amendments. It may reject one with more enthusiasm that rejects the other. It may reject one and not reject the other. But uh, that is the opinion I hold presently, and I do think it's best to keep to the recommendations of the two committees. Jimmy didn't wind up. Uh, just two uh, quick points. Uh, I think that's uh, been an interesting uh, discussion. I think it's quite clear from the comments that Adam Tomkins made uh, in his uh, question that there is actually some ambiguity over the competence of subsection 2, and I don't think that should be avoided or ignored. In fact, it seems that this odd clause seems like an unfortunate power grab by the minister. And I say that because he's giving Scottish ministers the ability to cherry-pick via consent or not giving consent, which bits of UK subordinate legislation it will give consent to and whether they will have effect or not. So he's saying to the UK ministers, you can make legislation, but I will decide if it is in effect or not. That sounds like a very uh, dangerous scenario to be in and entirely uh, out with uh, the entire objective of the continuity bill. It is simply nothing more than additional powers to the minister and a rather unfortunate one at that. Do you wish to press or withdraw your amendment? I press. 197, OK. The question is that amendment 197 be agreed to or all agreed? There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On amendment 197, there are three votes for it against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call amendment 198 in the name of Ross Greer. Already debated with Amendment 197. Ros Greer to move or not move? Move, convener. The question is Amendment 
eight be agreed or we all agreed. Um, there will be division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. There's a first. Is it a second? Well, well, well counted in that case, Minister. Amendment 198, there were three votes for, eight against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The question is that section 17 be agreed to, or all agreed? Your opposition is noted. Well, it's noted, and uh, yeah, call amendment 199 in the name of Neil Bibby, already debated with amendment 85. Neil Bibby to move or not move? Not moved. The question is that section 18 be agreed to or all agreed? No. Your opposition is noted. I now call amendment 200 in the name of Murdo Fraser, grouped with amendment 202. Murdo Fraser to move 200 and speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Um, Section 18 of the bill deals with uh, financial matters. My amendment 200 uh, has the effect of ensuring that the provisions in this bill on finance do not compromise the fiscal framework. Now, I could talk at great length about the operation of the fiscal framework, Convener, but I sense a certain weariness on the part of committee members at this stage in proceedings. So I will uh, I'll make it, I'll, well, despite the uh, exhortations I hear around me encouraging me to talk at length, I think I'll keep it fairly, I'll keep it fairly short. Uh, we're all familiar with the fiscal framework, uh, which uh, regulates the financial uh, arrangements between the uh, UK government uh, and the Scottish government pursuant to the 2016 uh, Scotland uh, Act. Now, sections 18, 19 and 20 of this bill all create substantial new powers for uh, Scottish ministers. For example, section 19 expands the right of public bodies to make charges where they are using the powers in the bill to deal with with deficiencies, comply with obligations and make provision in line with EU law after exit uh, date. So uh, clearly there are financial powers uh, within uh, the bill uh, and of course we know that uh, EU withdrawal will have major financial implications. Other there will be aspects of uh, spending policy currently determined at a European level returning to the UK and in due course returning uh, to Scotland for example in areas such as agricultural uh, support. So clearly there will be issues where uh, there will be an impact on the way that the fiscal framework uh, operates. And what this amendment is designed to do is ensure that uh, with the extensive new financial powers in the, in the bill, the complex situation of EU funding uh, and uh, the need to support that uh, fiscal framework, uh, we need to ensure that the fiscal framework is uh, protected as it currently exists um, and uh, that uh, the principles accepted uh, that, uh, as we say uh, in uh, the amendment, the fiscal framework must not be uh, undermined. Uh, I could go on at great uh, length in addition if required, uh, Convener, but I'll leave it at that and I'll re return to this in the wind-up. Thank you. Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 202 and other amendment in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. I support uh, 200 uh, by Murdo Fraser. Uh, 202, uh, I guess, arose because much of the conversation is around transposing law. Uh, in this bill. Very little attention has actually been given to our potential financial liabilities and withdrawal from the EU. And I think it's an important point to consider. Uh, members, of course, will be entirely uh, not surprised that there's nothing political in my motivation behind this amendment. Uh, for the simple reason that I felt it may have been overlooked in the bill's drafting, and I thought it was an important issue to raise, especially with the Finance and Constitution Committee and its deliberations at stage two. Uh, this additional section uh, to be included after section 22 relates to our liabilities resulting in loans paid from the European Investment Bank. Now, I'm not privy to all investments uh, made by the EIB, but I do know that they include, for example, £175 million for improvements to the M8, £192 million for investment in hospitals, and £50 million uh, from the European Strategic Investment Fund as part of the Scottish Government's Scottish European Growth co-investment programme. That alone is around £417 million. I suspect the final figure may be higher. In the interest of, interest of transparency, uh, I would hope that members think it is quite acceptable to ask Scottish ministers to outline to Parliament what those li liabilities are, 
as part of due diligence of the financial implications of this bill and indeed EU withdrawal to ensure that there are simply no unintended consequences in future Scottish budgets as a result of failing to identify them or indeed quantify them and indeed our repayment terms. I've chosen deliberately uh, the period by the end of the transition period uh, to do this, not exit day, because uh, uh, as when Scottish ministers should report to Parliament, because naturally the carving up of the liabilities will be part of the final exit negotiation. And I also think that should leave plentiful time for the minister to get a full realisation of the numbers and timescales. And I hope members find this an acceptable request. Thank you. Any other member of the committee wish to speak on this? I mean, Patrick. Thank you, convener. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm slightly unclear about the, um, uh, the issues raised in Amendment 202, and I, uh, I look forward to hearing the, the Minister's response to it, and in particular whether there is already any existing practice around uh, reporting these issues, and uh, would, would, you, would we actually be adding anything by passing this amendment. In relation to Amendment 200 from Murdo Fraser, uh, protecting uh, the, the principle of protecting the fiscal framework, um, I've got uh, three specific uh, issues. I, I'm, I think I'm, I'm worried that undermine might be a, a, a rather subjective test, uh, uh, open to uh, you know, a great deal of, of political interpretation about whether something undermines uh, the fiscal framework. That's one concern. The, the second concern is that it seems to me inevitable that the fiscal framework will change uh, uh, during, during this process, uh, either as a result of uh, functions uh, and the, the financial resources which uh, need to be transferred to carry out those functions uh, being devolved, or, and this is the third point, uh, as a result of a review of the fiscal framework, which is supposed to take place anyway. Uh, I seem to remember that the Smith Commission, uh, which debated the creation of the, uh, the, the, the devolved financial powers, which led to the, the fiscal framework, agreed that it should be reviewed. Uh, and I, if I remember rightly, that was a five-year timescale, which would place it squarely within the transition period. Um, now, it, it may be that it's impractical to, to uh, undertake a, a comprehensive review during the Brexit process itself, uh, but I, I don't think that we should bind our hands and be unable to change the fiscal framework uh, if indeed it has to, either as, as a result of uh, additional devolved functions uh, that are coming to this Parliament, uh, or uh, that, uh, that pre-scheduled review, which uh, with any luck might one day uh, help to tidy up the, the mess for which Adam Tompkins and I both bear a share of responsibility. James Kelly. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm not convinced about either of the, the amendments uh, in this group. The main concern of Murdo, Murdo Fraser seems to be that uh, there could be the potential for the fiscal framework being undermined. Uh, I would have thought implicit in the fiscal framework being in place would have been the fact that it should have the, the support of uh, ministers and you know, they, should, they shouldn't be acting to, to, to undermine it. Uh, in terms of 202, uh, like Patrick Harvey, I'd be interested to hear the Minister's explanation. I would have thought uh, that there, would, there must be a, I would have thought there would be a mechanism in place to ensure that the, the value of the loan arrangements with the European Investment Bank can be brought into the public arena without it having to be placed on the face of the bill. Thank you, James Kelly. Another member want to sp speak from the committee, that being the case. Minister. Uh, convener, I am conscious of the time. I don't want to digress too much, but I noticed John Scott arriving, who is the member for Troon, where my former school was. Brian Whittle is a former pupil at Mar College. I'm a former Mar College pupil, and Gerald Byrne, one of my officials, a former Mar College pupil. I make this point because uh, I had a teacher at Mar College, a music teacher, when I was doing music in my sixth year, who, when I presented a, a, a composition exercise, used to say, this looks as if it's been done between the soup and the fish. Obviously, it was a very grand school that they had many courses at dinners for the <laughs> music teachers. But the, the reality is that I have to say that these amendments do look as if they've been done between the soup and the fish, and I'll explain uh, why in just a second. The first reason is that uh, whilst I'm sure Murdo Fraser cares deeply about the uh, fiscal framework, nothing in this bill 
Nothing at all in this bill affects the matters to which his amendment refers, including the operation of the Scottish Consolidated Fund, the tax powers set out in the Scotland Act, the operation of the Scottish Government's fiscal framework, which underpins the powers set out in the Scotland Act 2016. It's therefore completely redundant. Um, I have to say, any preparatory expenditure, and I'm sure Mr Fraser has read the financial memorandum, any preparatory expenditure under, occurred under Section 18 required to be confirmed in the Annual Budget Act or regulations for revisions made under it, and existing financial accountability and governance arrangements must continue to be adhered to. Nothing in the bill removes the requirement for the Budget Act processes under the Public Finance and Accountability Scotland Act 2000 to be followed, and the provisions of the Scottish Public Finance Manual will continue to apply. Uh, and changes to the framework uh, are not within the gift of the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government, or this piece of legislation. Uh, and Patrick Harvey has pointed to their review as well. So th this amendment is completely redundant. Um, and in terms of, uh, and I agree with James Kelly actually, in terms of asking for information on loans, I would thought the best place to ask is the person who's lending the money. That is the uh, European Investment Bank. Now, I have to say, the lack of access to the European Investment Bank is going to be a very considerable problem for Scotland. Uh, and this is another of these consequences of Brexit that those backing Brexit should have thought about before they created these circumstances. And there is going to be, we're already seeing difficulties, because the money is not available. So Mr Green has perhaps unwittingly pointed to yet another downside of Brexit. But the reality of this situation is that the people to ask for this are the EIB. And in fact, uh, the, the amendment is also drafted in such a way that it doesn't require the Scottish government to say about its own loans. If it had done that, at least the, the amendment might have been uh, competent. But it doesn't say that. Uh, because the Scottish government is only one recipient of loans that exist right across Scotland. And the EIB has already said that it's provided more than three billion for direct investment in Scotland, with additional investment for UK-wide programmes. So this amendment is also redundant and unnecessary, and actually it's not even possible for it to achieve what it sets out to achieve. So I would, with respect, suggest that neither amendment should be proceeded with, because neither of them are necessary, and both of them uh, waste the time of this chamber, frankly. Murdo Fraser, to wind up. Oh, I'm, I'm, Thank you, I, I, I think Mr. Uh, Russell is starting to lose his temper a little bit yeah. at this yeah. stage uh, in, in proceedings. Yeah. Um, let me respond to a few of the points that have been made. Uh, first of all, um, Mr. Harvey made, made, made three specific points. First of all, he, he criticised the word undermine as being too subjective. I think if he'd read on in terms of the uh, amendment, he'd have seen in uh, uh, section two, paragraph B, the word undermine is actually defined uh, as meaning any regulations, enactment or act by the Scottish ministers that materially change the fiscal framework. And of course, Mr. Mr. Harvey is, is, is quite correct to say uh, as uh, uh, time goes on, whether we have a review or whether because of anything in this bill, the fiscal framework will have to change, and he's absolutely right, but that change has to come by negotiation, not by any unilateral action on the part of Scottish ministers through exercising the powers under this Act, and that is why I believe this amendment is appropriate. And uh, you know, the, the worst criticism Mr Russell could come up with of this uh, amendment is that it, it was unnecessary and redundant. Well, that's not our view, Mr Russell. Uh, our view is that having on the face of the bill a clear statement that the fiscal framework is unaffected um, it seems to me to make a lot of sense in terms of uh, providing assurance that nothing that Scottish ministers will do will affect uh, the fiscal framework. And if the worst that can be said of it is that it is redundant, uh, I think it makes it highly superior to many of the other amendments uh, which uh, Mr Russell has himself proposed to this bill, or indeed to the entire bill itself. So on that basis, Convener, I intend to press the amendment. We're obviously coming close to the end, and we're all, <laughs> and we're just getting a wee bit demob happy. So let's just keep going in the tone we had previously managed to achieve. Um, the question is: that Amendment 200 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. In that case, there will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 200, there were three votes for and eight against, and therefore Amendment 200 is not agreed to. I now call Amendment 52 in the name of Neil Finlay, already debated with Amendment 149. James Kelly to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 52 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, there will be a division. 
All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 52, there were five votes for, six against, and therefore the amendment is not agreed to. I call Amendment 201 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 71. Adam Tompkins, to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 201 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? There will be division. All those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against, please raise your hand. And amendment 201, there were three votes for, eight against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The question is that section 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Your opposition is noted. The question is that section 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Your opposition is noted again. I now call Amendment 53 in the name of Tavis Scott, already debated with Amendment 175. Tavis Scott, to move or not move? Move, Convener. The question is that Amendment 53 be agreed to. We're all agreed. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against, please raise your hand. On Amendment 53, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The question is that section 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Your opposition is noted. I call Amendment 54 in the name of Neil Finlay, already debated with Amendment 149. James Kelly, to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 54 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. Amendment 54, there were five votes for, there were six against, and therefore the amendment is not agreed to. The question is that section 22 be agreed to, or well agreed? Yes, Your opposition is noted. I call Amendment 202 in the name of Jamie Green. I already debated with Amendment 200. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Uh, convener, if the Minister thinks this amendment is a waste of time, it does beg the question Do you where are the amendments from his backbenchers? Or move I move the amendment. Or not move. Thank you. The amendment is that so the question is that Amendment 202 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. There will be a division. Uh, uh, all those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against, please raise your hand. Uh, uh, on Amendment 202, there were three votes for it against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The question is that Section 23 be and sorry, Section 23 to 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Amendment 203 in the name of amendment, the name of Alexander Burnett, already debated with Amendment 58. Alexander Burnett to move or not move? The question is Amendment 203 be agreed to or well agreed? There will be a division. Please, those in favour, please raise your hand. Those against, please raise your hand. On Amendment 203, there were three, four, eight against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The question is that section 27 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Your opposition is noted. Uh, the, I call amendment 204 in the name of Jamie Green. I already debated with amendment 58. And I remind members that if amendment 204 is agreed to, I cannot call amendment 55. Jamie Green to move or not move? To move. The question is that amendment 204 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 204, there were three votes for, eight against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call Amendment 55, in the name of Neil Finlay, already debated with Amendment 58. James Kelly, to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 55 be agreed to. Well agreed. Yes. We, was that all everyone get okay? We are agreed. I call Amendment 205 in the name of Donald Cameron, already debated with Amendment 58. Donald Cameron, to move or not move? Move. The question is Amendment 205 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against, please raise your hand. On Amendment 205, there were three votes for eight against, and therefore the amendment is not agreed to. The question is that section 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Your opposition is noted. I call amendment 206 in the name of Liam Kerr. Already debated with amendment 115. Liam Kerr to move or not move? Move. The question is that amendment 206 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division. 
All those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against, please raise your hand. Uh, there, there were uh, six for and five against. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The question is that section 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Your opposition is noted. <clears throat> um, I now call amendment 56 in the name of Tavis Scott, grouped with amendments 57, 207, 208, 209, 210, 211, 213. Tavis Scott to move Amendment 56 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Let me be very brief indeed. Uh, this relates uh, to scrutiny in urgent cases, and the two points I want to make relate uh, to Section 13. Uh, point one, uh, it relates to Amendment 56, which together with, the, with 57 make it clear that ministers cannot use the powers of urgency for Section 13 uh, proposals. Again, I simply wish to close down shortcuts from scrutiny for ministers who want to, this bill to equip them with the powers to keep pace with the EU law. Uh, I hope the, these amendments are entirely consistent with the themes that we have been pursuing over the course of the number of hours we've been here today. And I so move. Thank you. Ross Greer to speak to Amendment 207 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, uh, Convener. In situations that Minister consider to be urgent under Section 31, the Bill permits regulations that usually be subject to the affirmative procedure to instead be introduced immediately and only subject to affirmative vote 20 days later in order to avoid, uh, uh, in order to confirm if the change be uh, made permanent. Rather, uh, As the Bill currently stands, Ministers are obliged to lay a regulation before Parliament as soon as is practicable after signing it. That's a very open-ended term. As regulations can become law upon being signed, this urgency provision would permit a change in the law to be in effect for an unspecified period of time before even being laid before Parliament. Amendment 207 obliges ministers to lay any regulation made under this urgency provision within three working days. I would hope that, ministers, uh, that members who agree with this in principle, but who, who may have an issue with the three working days time, would agree to this and we could perhaps work out any issues around the timing at a technical amendment stage three. Ministers would still be required to lay the regulation as soon as it's practical, but there would now be an additional legally defined time limit. Amendment 211 permits Parliament to suspend the urgency provisions by resolution if it believes that provisions have been misused in any way, such as if a minority government were thought to have circumvented appropriate scrutiny of an issue where a parliamentary majority may have been lacking. Not that I'm suggesting this one would, of course. Parliament may, they, uh, may then reinstate the urgency provision again by resolution if it believes that sufficient steps have been taken to resolve the problem that led to the misuse of the urgency provision in the first place. In line with other amendments I've lodged, the purpose of 207 and 211 is to strengthen parliamentary scrutiny and oversight and affirm the role of this elected body in relation to government in this process. It does not place undue burden on government, but it does ensure that transparency to Parliament and thus the public and in turn that essential scrutiny happens in a timely and appropriate manner. Thank you. Uh, Murdo Fraser to speak to Amendment 208 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, amendments 208 and 209 deal with the question of regulations being introduced by Scottish Ministers in what are described in the Bill as urgent cases. As drafted, Section 31 provides that these regulations shall cease to have effect at the end of a period of 28 days unless these regulations are approved by a resolution of the Scottish Parliament. So as drafted, this is granting powers to Ministers to make emergency powers which have, will have immediate effect, but will then require to be approved by Parliament, and if this is not done, then these regulations will cease to have effect. What my Amendment 208 does is not object in principle to Scottish Ministers having uh, these emergency powers, but I feel the period of 28 days to get parliamentary approval is simply too long. This is an issue about proper parliamentary scrutiny of ministerial powers. Accordingly, my Amendment 208 reduces the period of 28 days in uh, section 31 subsection 4 to 14 days. This would still give Scottish ministers the power to make these regulations in urgent cases, but does require them to be approved by Parliament within 14 days, which seems to me a reasonable period, striking a balance between the need for proper parliamentary scrutiny and the freedom of ministers to act in urgent cases. Amendment 209 is simply a consequential amendment uh, to subsection 5 to change 28 days to 14 days to bring it into line with the amended subsection 4 should amendment 208 be carried. Jamie Green to speak to amendment 210 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. <clears throat> uh, subsection 2 currently states that regulations may be made 
without being subject to the affirmative procedure if they contain a declaration that Scottish ministers consider that by reason of urgency it is necessary to make regulations without being subject to that procedure. My amendment does two things. Uh, for this purpose, urgency should be better defined. Uh, we know there's much discourse around the definition of words like emergency and urgency, but nonetheless, the words consider that, in my view, leaves it open to ministers to decide and declare if something is urgent. And secondly, ensures that all such regulations are subject to the affirmative procedure. I urge members to adopt this additional layer of security that due process is followed Affirmative procedure is by far the best way to deal with regulation, especially those declared as urgent. Uh, I appreciate the Minister uh, may fall back on the defence that this makes the bill inoperable or unworkable, as previously stated. But as this relates to the passing of uh, uh, regulation uh, which is deemed as urgent, then I uh, would uh, strongly uh, propose that affirmative procedure is the best way to deal with that. Thank you. Adam Tompkins to speak to Amendment 213 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Gamine. I think Amendment 213 has been lodged in error, but the error was mine, for which I apologise. But I would want to record my support for all of the other amendments in this group. OK. Any other committee member wish to speak at this stage? Neil Bibby. Thanks, Convener. There are eight amendments in this group uh, dealing with Section 31 of the Bill principally and uh, minded to support all of them. Section 31, as we know, relates to scrutiny of regulations in urgent cases. Given the concerns that members of the committee and members in the chamber have expressed about scrutiny and transparency uh, throughout this process, it is important that Section 31 of the Bill is, is robust, and uh, that is why I will support um, the amendments in this grouping to ensure that Section 31 of the Bill is fair, proportionate and robust. Mr. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Uh, I think there is a general agreement that there is a need for procedures in relation to urgent matters, but that they need to be limited. Um, I'm not convinced uh, by Jamie Green's argument, and I, I worry that his amendment uh, might have the effect, uh, or whatever its intentions, of preventing something uh, urgent from being taken forward urgently. Uh, I think it may have a, a, a very serious practical effect. Um, the others, uh, I, I see some merit for, uh, naturally, I, I'm happy to support my uh, colleague Ross Greer and his proposals. Uh, the three working day, uh, the three, three day um, uh, requirement um, in uh, Amendment 207 is in line with uh, existing guidance as uh, members will be aware this was discussed at committee previously. Uh, I think the, the normal expectation is two working days. Uh, the, the DPLR committee has the ability to take action if something hasn't been laid by the third day. Uh, and so I think a, a requirement on three working days uh, is uh, very helpful. Uh, and the emergency break, break provision, I hope, is something that we would never feel that we need to use. But having it available to us uh, is one of the things that I think would give government the incentive to ensure that, in fact, we don't ever need to use it. Um, Tavish Scott's amendments I'm certainly open to. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the argument that uh, in relation to the keeping pace section, uh, urgency is not necessarily relevant in, uh, in that area. Uh, and in relation to Murdo Fraser's uh, arguments, uh, I'll certainly be open to hearing the response from the, the minister, uh, but I, I see some uh, some merit in the, the arguments that Murdo Fraser has put forward on reducing the time limit. Okay, thank you. Any other member wish to speak from the committee? We should speak at this stage. We don't, so, Minister. Thank you, convener. Um, can I first of all say that I'm, I'm glad that I had not decided to take Adam Tonkin's amendment 213, or it would have been a little embarrassing to have accepted something that wasn't meant to be there. But I want to be very constructive, very constructive indeed, and I'm approaching these last two sections in a mood not just of uh, wishing to be helpful, but also conscious of the time, so let me do so. Uh, uh, in terms of Ross Greer's, the only amendments in this group that I have problems with, and I'll come on briefly to the rest in a moment, are Ross Greer's Amendment 207 and Jamie Green's Amendment and Neil Bibby's Amendment. Let me explain uh, the circumstances in, in which I have problems with these. The first is Ross Greer's Amendment. Uh, it, it is not that I don't recognize the need to do so, but the three days is impossible to meet. And it is impossible to meet because standing orders allow laying of instruments during days when the office of the clerk is open. 
there are periods of three days or more when the office is not open. The amendment doesn't make clear what the consequences of a failure to lay within three days would be. In these circumstances, it's entirely legitimate that doubt could be cast over the validity of instruments. These arrangements are robustly policed in practice by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. And if three days goes into this bill, it will mean there are, there are instruments which will be questioned in, in a way that can't be questioned now. So I would ask him not to proceed with this. If he wants to proceed with something that is likely to be more accurate, I'm happy to discuss that urgently over the next two or three days. But three days is simply impossible because of the other regulations that exist. Now, Murdo Fraser's amendments, which reduce the period which Parliament has to approve or not approve regulations under the urgent procedure from 28 days to 14, the procedure needn't take 28 days. It could be done more swiftly. But I don't think there's any great harm in this. If Murdo Fraser will accept that I want just to reflect on this over the next few days, and I might come back at stage three with an amendment that makes 1421 or something, but I'm not averse to putting this in the bill at the stage while we think about this at this stage. Um, I don't want him to think that I regard this as uh, unnecessary or wasting time in any way. I am absolutely sure that this is, uh, I won't say in contrast to some other things, a genuine serious amendment which could be helpful. But uh, he, he is indicating he does accept that I will come back and uh, think about this over the next uh, few days. Now, I, I do recognise the point of Jamie Green's Amendment 210, and I understand the anxiety about the situations in which urgency might arise. But I think the amendment is actually misconceived. Urgency speaks for itself. And, and I do doubt if any attempt to statutorily define it would make things much clearer, might only introduce unnecessary and destabilizing uncertainties into the question of when the section might be used. I, I've said before, and I want to say again, we don't want to have to rely on section 31. We would only do so when absolutely necessary, when there is urgency. But we, like the UK government in its own bill, recognise that leaving the EU is exactly the sort of situation where we might have to move very swiftly indeed. Um, Taffy Scott's amendments 56 and 7 are intended to prevent the urgent procedure from being used for keeping pace regulations. We have been here before, but I'm happy to accept these. Uh, and in terms of uh, uh, number 211, um, I am inclined to accept this again under the condition that there will require to be a conversation about some of the details within this. There are some things which I think need to be tidied up and improved. But I am trying to indicate how positive I am, uh, it being 8.23. So the only two areas that I've indicated I think are difficult, I would hope that Ross Graham might withdraw uh, to uh, 207, and that would be very helpful. And I don't uh, hope that Jamie Green might be persuaded to withdraw his uh, amendment on the grounds that I don't think it clarifies anything and could make things more difficult. Okay, Tavish Scott to wind up. Convener, uh, firstly, may I thank the Minister for uh, the tone of the remarks he's just uh, given to colleagues across the uh, Chamber and indeed his officials for the way in which uh, they've conducted themselves over the last couple of days. And uh, we started on scrutiny, we're going to finish on scrutiny. And uh, I, I do recognise that uh, the minister has, minister has gone a long way to recognising the concerns that Parliament's expressed on a number of occasions. Uh, colleagues uh, who've led individual mem uh, amendments here will wish to reflect on uh, the position they're in vis-a-vis -vis the government's support or uh, not, but we've certainly uh, moved a long way. Um, the only final thing I'd like to th say uh, is I'd like to thank you, Mr Crawford, for your uh, careful consideration of the last couple of days and your handling of what's been a long period. Thank you very much indeed. The press will withdraw your amendment at the I'll same press. time. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you have a bit more work to do, I'll press. <laughs> The question is, Amendment 56 be agreed to? Have all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 57, the name of Tavish Scott. Ready to be with Amendment 56. Tavish Scott, to move or not move? Uh, move, convener. The question is, that Amendment 57 be agreed to? Have all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. Well, call Amendment 207, in the name of Ross Greer. Ready to be with Amendment 56. Ross Greer, to move or not move? I'll take the Minister's offer and not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 208, in the name of Murdo Fraser, ready to debate with Amendment 56. Murdo Fraser, to move or not move? Uh, in view of the Minister's more cheerful comments than previously, um, I'll not move. I call Amendment 209, in the name of Murdo Fraser, ready to debate with Amendment 56. Murdo Fraser, to move or not move? Uh, not move. I call Amendment 210, in the name of Jamie Green, ready to debate with Amendment 56. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Respectfully, not moved. The question is that Section 31 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, your opposition is noted.
call Amendment 211 in the name of Ross Greer. Already debated with Amendment 56. Ross Greer to move or not move? Convener. Sorry? Convener. The question is that Amendment 211 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. Call Amendment 212 in the name of Liam Kerr. Already debated with Amendment 115. Liam Kerr to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 212 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That means there will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. And Amendment 212, there were six votes for, five against. That means that Amendment 212 is agreed to. I now call Amendment 213 in the name of Adam Tompkins. Already debated with Amendment 56. Adam Tompkins, to move or not move? Not move. The question is that Section 32 be agreed to or well agreed? Your opposition is noted. I call Amendment 214 in the name of Adam Tompkins. Already debated with Amendment 58. To Adam Tompkins to move or not move? Move. The question is Amendment 214 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against, please raise your hand. Um, an Amendment 214, there were three votes for and eight against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. So that's what we're doing okay. Certainly. To call Amendment 215. Is it possible to um, call, move and vote on Amendments 215 to 225 on block? Uh, the clerks are advising me no. Okay. So, unfortunately. I call Amendment 215 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 58. Adam Tompkins to move or not move? Move. The question is Amendment 215 be agreed to or will agreed? There will be, there will be division. Those in favour, please show, no, raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. On Section 33, uh, no, sorry, that's, that's on, a, on Amendment 215. There were th three votes for, eight against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. A comment 216 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debate moved. With Amendment 58. And Mr Tompkins to move or not move, and he's already moved. So the question is that Amendment 50, 216 be agreed to, or well agreed. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 216, there are three votes for eight against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call Amendment 217. In the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 58. Adam Tompkins to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 217 be agreed or well agreed? Move. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 217, with three votes for eight against, the amendment is therefore not agreed to. Call Amendment 218 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 58. Adam Tompkins to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 218 be agreed to or well agreed? Move. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against, please raise your hand. On Amendment 218, there are three votes for eight against. Two, amendment 218 is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 119, Adam Tompkins. Sorry. Is that what I say? Right. It's getting late. I call Amendment 219 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 58. Adam Tompkins to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 219 being agreed, are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 19, there were three votes for eight against. That means the amendment is not agreed to. I call Amendment 100, sorry, 220 in the name of Adam Tompkins. Already debated with Amendment 58. Adam Tompkins to move or not move? Move. The question is Amendment 220 be agreed to or well agreed? There will be division. All those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against, please raise your hand. On Amendment 220, there were three votes for and eight against. That means the amendment is not agreed to.
I now call Amendment 221 in the name of Adam Tompkins. We're already debated with Amendment 58. Adam Tompkins to move or not move? Move. The question is Amendment 221 be agreed to or well agreed? Yes. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against, please raise your hand. On Amendment 221, there were three votes for eight against. That means the amendment is not agreed to. I call Amendment 222 in the name of Adam Tompkins already debated with Amendment 58. Adam Tompkins to move or not to move? Move. The question is Amendment 222 be agreed to or well agreed? Yes. There will be division. All those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against, please raise your hand. Amendment 222, three votes for and eight against. I call Amendment 223 in the name of Adam Tompkins. Already debated with Amendment 58. Adam Tompkins to move or not move? Move. The question is Amendment 223 agreed, be agreed, or will agreed? Yes. There will be division. All those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against, please raise your hand. On Amendment 223, there were three votes for, eight against, and therefore the amendment is not agreed to. I call Amendment 224 in the name of Adam Tompkins already debated with Amendment 58. Adam Tompkins to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 224 be agreed to or well agreed. Yes. There will be a division. Uh, all those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 224, there were three votes for, eight against. That means that the amendment is not agreed to. And amendment two, I call Amendment 225 in the Adam Tompkins already debated with Amendment 58. Adam Tompkins to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 225 be agreed to or well agreed? Yes. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 225, there were three votes for, eight against. That means the amendment is not agreed to. The question is that Schedule 1 be agreed to, or well agreed? No. Your opposition is noted. The question is that Section 34 be agreed to, or well agreed? The question is that Schedule 2 be agreed to, or well agreed? No. Your opposition is noted. I call Amendment 226 in the name of Adam Tompkins. Are we debated with Amendment 71? Adam Tompkins to move or not move? move. The question is that Amendment 226 be agreed to, or well agreed? Yeah. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against, please raise your hand. On Amendment 226, there are three votes for eight against. That means the amendment is not agreed to. The question is that Section 35 be agreed to or well agreed? No. Your opposition is noted. The question is that section, Schedule 3 be agreed to or well agreed? No. Your opposition is noted. The question is that Section 36 be agreed to or well agreed? No. Your opposition is noted. I now call Amendment 227 in the name of Jamie Green, grouped with Amendment 228. Jamie Green to move Amendment 227 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. It seems quite apt that in the final hurdle of Stage 2, we are discussing the penultimate section of the Bill, in this case, uh, the repeal of the Act. Um, by the end of this debate, the Chamber will have discussed 227 31 amendments uh, around the implications and consequences of this bill. The bill is subject to further amendments at stage three. But despite our best of intentions, there may be notable issues that we will not have foreseen or which have been overlooked once the bill passes, if it does so. I propose a very simple addition to the bill calling for a review of the Act. Unlike other pieces of legislation which do not specify a review and rely on the normal post-legislative process, this act will be subject to quite fast moving changes in the political and constitutional landscapes around it. It seems sensible to me and I hope to others to ask ministers to review it as soon as practical uh, to see if the bill is achieving its objectives. Uh, whether the parliament or the courts review it first is another matter perhaps. I have not specified the timescale in this in the hope that the minister will agree to the principle without any prescribed period. Uh, not notwithstanding my amendment, section, seven, section 37 on the repeal of this Act uh, remains in place, uh, mutatis mutandis. On that note, I'd like to thank you, convener, and the parliamentary staff for your
diligence and patience uh, throughout these sessions, and also to the committee members for considering my 23 amendments. And on that note, I'm out. Thank you. Not quite. You've still got a withdrawal to do. Uh, 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 sorry, I wind up, I mean. Uh, Liam Kerr, to speak to Amendment 228 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. My Amendment 228 requires that Section 37.1 lose the words or any provision of this Act. The stated purpose of the Section 37 is to allow Ministers to repeal the Act. That is fine, but this specific phrase allows them to delete any provision of the Act. It doesn't put any limits on that. It is any provision that can simply be repealed. That creates the clear risk that Scottish Ministers decide to repeal part of the Act that, for example, Im improves scrutiny of regulations or that which limits their financial powers. In short, we should keep the idea that the Act can be swiftly repealed, but without vacillating, the Committee should strip out this partial and dangerous ability to pick and choose which bits of the Act can or can't be repealed and agree to Amendment 228. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members wish to speak in this grouping? Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener, um, and thank you for your birthday wishes earlier. Um, over the past two days, I have listened carefully to contributions from members of the committee, members in chamber, and contributions from the minister, and I have taken many notes, which I am sure I will use as the bill proceeds. The language in the bill and the amendments is technical, and as a recent addition to the committee, and this being my first experience at scrutiny at stage two, this has been valuable and engaging. And I would like to thank all involved in the process, including Parliament staff, committee clerks, convener, yourself, um, members and the ministerial team, as well as the minister. Um, I'd like to address uh, or take the opportunity to speak to uh, Amendment 227 in the name of Jamie Green and the amendment which would be entered after Section 36, as stated, would require Scottish ministers to carry out a review of the Act as soon as practicable, although I think the wording that uh, Jamie Green said was practical, but the written word is practicable, so that might need a bit of clarification, after exit day, and that this would present uh, the opportunity for Parliament to provide a review or a report. So in defining practicable, I sought the definition from Webster's, and I thought this Webster's de de definition um, which might be meaningful to my colleague Liam Kerr, MSP, um, is as follows. Practical, practicable is something capable of being done or accomplished with available means or resources. So, with that said, I believe this amendment, number 227, is reasonable and will make the current bill more open and transparent, allowing Parliament continued scrutiny after exit day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Emma Harper. Um, James Kelly. Uh, thank you, Convener. Very briefly, just place on record on behalf of myself and my colleague Neil Bibby, thanks to yourself for the thorough way you have overseen proceedings and also for the Parliament staff who have worked through these uh, long sessions uh, to ensure that proceedings have, uh, have moved efficiently, if maybe not quite, quickly, because of the politicians <laughs> and the long speeches. Uh, in terms of this section, uh, I support Amendment 227. Uh, I think the idea of a review is eminently sensible. I oppose uh, Liam Kerr's motion 228 uh, in the sense that it pushes us, pushes towards a position of full repeal as opposed to partial repeals, which may be uh, may be required in certain circumstances. Thank you, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Can I just uh, echo the uh, warm uh, comments and, and thanks that have been expressed uh, to the convener to. Uh, committee colleagues, clerks and officials, and to all of the Parliament staff who have uh, made these extraordinary sessions possible and, and helped us through it all. Uh, in relation to uh, Amendment 228, uh, I'll just say that it does seem odd to me to allow uh, ministers by regulations to repeal the whole Act, but not, for example, to decide uh, that the urgency provisions are no longer required and that those should be repealed or that some other individual aspect uh, is no longer required. Uh, so I'm not convinced by 228. In relation to 227, uh, I'm surprised there's so much appetite. It seems to me we're all going to have plenty to do uh, at the time just after the, uh, the, the exit day. But fine, if people want to have a review of the Act, well, who am I to stand in the way? Um, no other member, I think, has indicated they want to speak. So, Minister. 
Thank you, convener, and thank you for your um, uh, inspirational chairing of this uh, committee over the uh, last two days. You have managed to keep uh, order in a, in a very effective way and to calm the passions that would otherwise have arisen, which uh, from time to time showed signs of breaking out, but you stamped on them very professionally indeed. And, uh, and thank to the officials, all the officials, uh, the officials of this committee, the parliamentary officials, the official report, uh, the, those who have been in charge of the uh, audiovisual services, those who provided sandwiches, particularly this evening where there was a ample sufficiency, uh, last night perhaps just slightly less than we had required, um, and all others have taken part. And uh, thank you also to all those members who have come to observe this. It's not often that committees are uh, spectator sports, and particularly not by other MSPs. Whether this is solidarity only with your Conservative colleagues, and I address the Conservative members, or whether it is a genuine interest in the proceedings of this Parliament, or whether it's a combination of those things, I'm grateful for the ever-changing, and that will not have been observed by most people, the ever-changing cast of Conservative MSPs who flitted across this chamber. Uh, well, flitted, perhaps, is a generous word. Some, some came and stayed, and some left early. But uh, they took part in this, as did some uh, other members. I saw Christina uh, uh, McKelvey here yesterday, for example, observing it. And this has been a unique uh, event, and uh, let's hope we keep it unique. Um, I want to make a point, convener, before I come to these amendments, on what will happen next. Uh, clearly, the presiding officer will set a date for Stage 3 amendments, and Stage 3 is scheduled for next week. I, I want to make a general statement of intent. It is not, I I'm very aware of the decisions of this committee. It's not my intention to endeavour to reverse any decision of this committee unless it makes the bill inoperable. Uh, and I make that commitment here. And I hope that might be matched by a commitment from others to, to accept uh, also the rejection of ideas that have existed here. And therefore, we come into stage three uh, freshly uh, with uh, looking at this bill to make it a better bill. I entirely accept that some people do not wish this bill to succeed and will uh, wish to continue in that way and will vote against it. But uh, I don't see any need for a repetition of 232 amendments. I think we know where we are with this bill now, and therefore amendments that genuinely improve the bill uh, and which have a chance of success would be the right thing to do. And I make the commitment that I'm not going to go into the chamber in any other spirit. Um, let me now deal with these amendments. Um, I do think it's a pity that perhaps uh, a, um, a, a, a Jamie Green did not consult his colleague Maurice Golden because we've accepted a an Amendment 186 on a reporting function for this bill already. Um, however, I don't want to end this on a churlish nature, so that would be very unlike me. So as a result of this, um, I'm going to accept this amendment. Uh, I, perhaps it would be uh, helpful if uh, uh, Jamie Green and Morris Golden were to get together and to see whether they could bring their uh, ideas together so we would get one procedure for reporting, and that would help everybody and cut out unnecessary bureaucracy, which I know is a, a Tory aim. Um, in terms of Liam Kerr's amendment, I am tempted to say that the, uh, having looked at the word practicable, I'm happy to add another dictionary to the pile, which would be dwelly, practical in Gaelic is geantha. But as that would not help his understanding of these matters, particularly in the pubs which he frequents, uh, I think I would just want to say that I have no great difficulty with his amendment. The purpose of this bill, undoubtedly, is to provide the circumstances which are needed should the Parliament refuse legislative consent and should we in a, be in a position not to have an agreement on the UK bill. So it is an either-or, and in those circumstances I will also, in the spirit of generosity, accept this amendment. So we do not have to divide on these two amendments unless we actually wish to do so. Uh, convener, we will um, meet again very shortly. I'm giving evidence to two parliamentary committees tomorrow on this bill, and then we will have the stage three proceedings next week. I really do hope we can do that in the spirit that you have set uh, in the last two days, and we can do it in a way that is uh, full, thoughtful, but perhaps not quite as long as we have spent in the last more than uh, 24 hours. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Jimmy Green, you wish to wind up? Uh, there's always a temptation to uh, retort to uh, the Minister, but uh, on this note, I will maintain the more high ground in that and say thank you. Uh, for uh, uh, the feedback and also for the support for that particular amendment. Um, what I would say in all serious, seriousness to the Minister is that he has made a number of commitments over the last few days to individual members across the board to revisit uh, many aspects, especially amendments that were withdrawn, and I do hope that he does uh, do so. It's no secret that 
uh, these benches oppose the introduction of this bill, but I hope that our actions over the last few days have proved that we played a very productive and proactive part in shaping this bill as it goes into stage three. Thank you. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 227 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 228 in the name of Liam Kerr. I debate with Amendment 227. Liam Kerr to move or not move? Moved. The question is Amendment 228 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Moved. Okay, there will be a division. All those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against, please raise your hand. On Amendment 228, there were eight votes for, three against. The amendment is therefore agreed to. I'll call Amendment 229 in the name of Alexander Burnett. I've already debated with Amendment 59. Alexander Burnett, to move or not move? I moved. The question is Amendment 229 be agreed to. Well agreed. Yes. Uh, there'll be division. Um, all those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against, please raise your hand. Uh, and, and amendment, amendment 229, there were three votes for eight against, uh, and the amendment is therefore not agreed to. Call Amendment 230 in the name of uh, Alexander Burnett, already updated Amendment 58. Alexander Burnett, to move or not move? Move. The question is Amendment 230 be agreed or well agreed? Yeah. There will be division. Those in favour, please raise your hand. <laughs> Those against, please raise your hand. On Amendment 230, the three votes for eight against. That means the amendment is not agreed to. I call Amendment 231 in the name of Jamie Green. I've already debated Amendment 58. Jamie Green to move or not move? Moved. The question is, Amendment 231 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? No. Uh, there will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. Uh, amendment 231, there were three votes for. There were Eight against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The question is that section 37 be agreed to. Well agreed. The question is that section 38 be agreed to. Well agreed. No. Your opposition is noted. The question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Your opposition is noted. That ends stage two considerations of the bill. Um, but before, before we uh, part for tonight, though, I'd just like to say I think we've subjected this bill to some significant and substantial scrutiny. I want to thank all members of the parliamentary staff who have supported the committee through our proceedings, um, all members of the parliament who have either contributed or attended at any stage, the minister and his government officials for the way they've gone about their business, uh, but particularly the parliamentary clerks who have helped me clamp down on any unnecessary passions that might have been arised, arising and in danger of causing any problems. So thank you for keeping me right also, and thank you all, everyone genuinely, and I close this session of the Finance Committee.